Hey guys, welcome to the cardiovascular lectures. This is lecture number one. Let's get started. We are going to first talk about cardiovascular embryology. So let's get started with a multiple choice question. As always with multiple choice questions, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So remember that when looking at cardiac looping, the primary heart tube begins looping at four weeks with the goal of establishing left to right polarity. Now, what kind of pathology can happen here? Well, one major defect that can happen is when we have a dynein defect and it doesn't rotate correctly, leading to a condition known as dextrocardia. Now, don't forget that this pathology, meaning the dynein defect, this is also associated with Cartagener syndrome. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, so hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is D. So one of the most important concepts that we need to know about cardiac embryology is the septation of the chambers. And this is a multi-step process. Now for this specific question, we need to know that the septum primum closes against the septum secundum, thus sealing off the foramen ovale soon after birth. This is done thanks to an increase in left atrial pressure and a decrease in right atrial pressure. All right, now let's take a look at the next couple slides there in your book. I wanna walk you through a quick review of the steps that take a developing heart from wide open to the fully formed atrial septum. All right, now, in step one here, we see that the septum primum grows towards the endocardial cushions, leading to a narrowing of the foramen primum. In step two, the foramen secundum forms in the septum primum, while we see the regression of the foramen primum. In step three, the septum secundum develops on the right side of the septum primum, while we see that the foramen secundum is maintaining the right to left shunt. In step four here, the septum secundum expands and covers most of the foramen secundum. The residual foramen is then known as the foramen ovale. And then in step five here, we see that the remaining portion of the septum primum forms the one-way valve of the foramen ovale. Now, at this point, the septum primum closes against the septum secundum, thus sealing the foramen ovale shortly after birth when the left atrial pressure increases and the right atrial pressure decreases. During infancy and early childhood, the septum primum and septum secundum fuse, thus giving rise to the atrial septum. Now, what happens if the septum primum and secundum don't fuse properly after birth? Well, we get what is known as a patent foramen ovale. Most of these can be left untreated as long as they aren't symptomatic. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. So as a continuation of atrial development, we have the ventricles, for which we have three main steps we need to know. Step one is the formation of the interventricular septum. The opening that we have as this occurs is known as the interventricular foramen. In step two, the aortical pulmonary septum rotates and fuses with the muscular ventricular septum to form the membranous interventricular septum, which leads to closure of the interventricular foramen. And in step three, we see growth of the endocardial cushions, which separates the atria from the ventricles and contributes to atrial septation and the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. A ventricular septal defect, or VSD, which is the most common congenital cardiac anomaly, is likely to be the result of a problem with the membranous septum. Now, in the development of our outflow tract, we need neurocrest cell and endocardial cell migration to aid in the formation of the truncal and bulbar ridges, which spiral, fuse, and then form the aortical pulmonary septum, leading to the formation of the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. Abnormalities of this region associated with failure of neural crest cell migration include a persistent truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, and tetralogy of Fallot. Also, don't forget that the aortic and the pulmonary valves are derived from endocardial cushions of the outflow tract, 
while the mitral and tricuspid valves are derived from fused endocardial cushions of the AV canal. All right, let's do two matching exercises uh, about heart embryology just to test your knowledge of the heart structures and their origins, and then we will move on. All right, here is your first matching exercise. Go ahead, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back for the correct answers. All right, here is your next matching exercise. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, come on back, and we will discuss what we need to know. All right. Let's go over all these structures and their derivatives just really quickly as a refresher. This is stuff you should know, so I just want to touch on it quickly. So the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk, these are from the embryonic truncus arteriosus. The outflow tracts of the left and right ventricles, also referred to as smooth parts, are derivations of the bulbous cordis. The trabeculated part of the left and right ventricle come from the primitive ventricle, while the trabeculated part of the left and right atria come from the primitive atrium. The coronary sinus comes from the left horn of the sinus venosus, whereas the right horn of the sinus venosus, this gives rise to the smooth part of the right atrium, also known as the sinus venarium. The endocardial cushions, these give rise to a few important structures like the AV and semilunar valves, the atrial septum, and the membranous interventricular septum. The superior vena cava, this comes from the right cardinal vein and the right anterior cardinal vein while the inferior vena cava comes from the posterior, subcardinal, and supracardinal veins. And finally, the primitive pulmonary vein gives rise to the smooth part of the left atrium. All right, let's move on to our next question. Multiple choice, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, your correct answer here is B. So fetal circulation is always high yield. So let's take a quick look at the highlights that we need to know in order to confidently walk into the exam. So a couple things to keep in mind before diving into the pathway of fetal blood. First, remember that umbilical arteries, these have low oxygen content. The umbilical veins, these are about 80% saturated with oxygen. The umbilical vein also has a PO2 of around 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, when a baby's born, takes its first, first breath, we immediately get a decrease in resistance in the pulmonary vasculature. This increases the left atrial pressure as compared to the right atrial pressure, and this will close the foramen ovale. Now, an increase in oxygen and a drop in prostaglandins, which is the result of placental separation, leads to closure of the ductus arteriosus. Now, remember that if we need to close the PDA, what medication can we use? Indomethacin. Now, what can we use if we want to keep it open? Prostaglandins. All right, now there's three uh, shunts in fetal circulation that we need to know. First, hepatic circulation. This is bypassed as blood enters the fetus through the umbilical vein and moves into the IVC via the ductus venosus. Now, most of the oxygenated blood that reaches the heart, which of course does, throw, does so through the IVC, moves through the foramen ovale into the left atrium, and then the final shunt is the result of high fetal pulmonary artery resistance due to low oxygen tension. And what happens here is deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava will make its way to the descending aorta through this pathway. Right atrium, the right ventricle, the main pulmonary artery, the ductus arteriosus, and the descending artery. All right, let's do a quick matching exercise. I want you to hit the pause button, figure this one out, come on back, and then I'll give you the correct answers. All right, guys, here are your correct answers. These 
fetal to postnatal derivatives, these are always high yield and fair game. So you want to make sure you know these. They're in your books. This is <clears throat> one of those topics where there's a lot of really easy points you can accumulate. And like I always say, you want to accumulate the easy points everywhere you can. You can't miss out on these easy points because the more little easy points you accumulate, the more leeway you have to make a couple mistakes here and there, but also the next level, it's going to take your score there. If you're, if you're going to do good, accumulating a lot of little wins here and there will make your score great. Um, it could take you from great to off the charts, or it could take you from sub-passing to passing. So make sure you know these, these sorts of questions here. These are going to definitely help your score. All right, let's take a quick break. See you guys in the next lecture.